Hey everybody, Dr. Yersigen here. A um, little bit of uh, technical difficulties there for the last minute or so, but I think we're up and running now. So I was asked to jump on here with Facebook Live and chat with you guys about some of the very common uh, non-surgical questions that come up uh, survive, surrounding bariatric surgery, what to expect, not so much you know, anything about the sleeve or the bypass or the duodenal switch, but more specifically, like, what can, what, what, what's going to happen to me? What, what, uh, how's my life going to be, um, you know, altered after the surgery and things like that. So I got a list of questions that the girls here at the office have kind of put together, which are the most common questions that they get asked or they hear asked uh, about the surgeries or about what to expect around the time of surgery that I think I'll just go through. Um, got about 15 questions here, so we'll probably spend the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes going over this stuff. Uh, before we get started, though, I wanted to say I hope everybody is is safe. I hope everybody is uh, practicing social distancing uh, when they can, uh, trying to stay home as much as they can, um, staying sanitized as much as you can, um, and hopefully we'll get through this uh, this epidemic without with any more without any more losses of lives than we need. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, if you're sitting at home and you're thinking about, hey, I, bariatric surgery might be for me, uh, Garden State Bariatrics is still open. We're offering uh, online uh, telemedicine uh, consultations. The process isn't come in, get your consultation, have surgery. So it is a, it is a process. It takes a couple months. So if you're sitting at home uh, thinking about what you could be doing next towards your health, uh, maybe give us a call and uh, set up a telemedicine appointment. And we can talk about uh, uh, talk about getting getting you into surgery and, and getting your life back. So, first question, uh, and I think this is a common question, is uh, how quickly will I lose weight? So, typically after weight loss surgery, um, the weight loss is kind of front loaded. You lose more weight weight in the beginning, and then it starts to taper off over the the next two years after surgery. Um, you typically lose half of the weight you're going to lose in the first six to nine months after surgery. Uh, and then the rest, like I said, is a, is a slow trickle. Um, most people lose somewhere around 30 pounds in the first month. So uh, front-loaded weight loss, uh, and it starts to trickle as we get further out. Um, so you can lose about 30 pounds in the first month. That's about how, that's quick, how quickly you may lose weight after surgery. Um, how long will I be out of work? So everybody's a little bit different when it comes to this, um, but typically, uh, people are out of work between 10 and 14 days after surgery. There are some people that take a little bit longer. There are people that are climbing the walls and want to get back to work sooner. Um, but typically 10 to 14 days is how long uh, most people are out of work after the surgery. Um, the next question, how long will I be in the hospital? Uh, again, this, everybody's a little bit different how, what they need as far as TLC while they're in the hospital. Uh, but typically, uh, it's usually one night overnight in the hospital, and you go home the next day around lunchtime. Um, there can be some variables there, uh, specifically a patient who has more underlying medical problems may need more time in the hospital. Um, obviously, we're not going to kick a person out before they're ready, uh, but if they're, as long as they're doing well and the vast majority of people are doing well the next day, go home in about uh, 24 hours or so after the surgery. My next question, can somebody stay in the hospital with me? Now, this, is a, this question is altered quite a bit uh, by current situations. Right now, most hospitals, and probably for the foreseeable, for the foreseeable future, most hospitals will not allow uh, a significant amount of um, people visiting or staying with someone else while they're in the hospital. Even when we get back to norm, some form of normalcy and start doing elective operations again, there's a good chance that the hospitals will maintain um, the social distancing and not allowing uh, extraneous people in the hospital. That being said, when we do get back to normal normal, uh, there's a very good chance, and it's again hospital policy, whether or not someone can stay with you in the hospital. So that's specific to the different hospitals that we work at. Uh, next question, what is the hardest part? This is a very common question. Uh, the hardest part in my belief system is changing bad habits. So whatever was the process that got you to where you are now, 
there are bad habits that are associated with gaining weight and not exercising and not following the rules. Those are the hardest things to change. The operation, the process towards surgery is pretty regimented and it's uh, pretty straightforward usually. Um, but that all being said, um, there's nothing harder uh, in this world than changing habits and especially changing bad habits. Um, and so that's probably the hardest part of the whole process. How long is the process before it gets approved through insurance? Now, every insurance company is different, uh, but typically it takes approximately three months from the first consultation to the time of having surgery. Um, every, the, the length of time is different from people to people, uh, depending on how many medical problems a patient may have. Uh, they may need more workup or more preparation prior to surgery. Um, but the typical patient takes about three months from uh, first consultation to surgery. So that goes back to speaking to the idea that it takes a little while to have surgery anyway. So why not have a discussion with us to see if surgery is right for you, if it's something you really want to go ahead with. Uh, again, we offer telemedicine and we offer the ability to talk to us remotely um, to try to get you on the path so that when we do get back to normalcy after COVID-19, that we will have some, uh, we already have a, a leg up, we'll already be kind of in the process of getting towards surgery. Um, next question, what are the chances of getting a gastric leak? So typically with the different operations, the sleeve, the gastric bypass, the duodenal switch, the leak rate, uh, at least in the literature, is approximately 1%. So that's the, a leak where the contents of your stomach leak outside of your stomach into your belly, causing an infection. Once, uh, so the, the risk of a, of a leak is approximately 1%. If someone were to develop a leak, then there's a longer period of time uh, in order to get that leak fixed to manage that patient. That typically means another operation and some time in the hospital if that were to happen. Um, the next one. Is dumping syndrome common with every procedure? So it's possible with every procedure, the sleeve, the bypass, and the duodenal switch, but not particularly common. The most common operation uh, of those three to develop dumping syndrome is the gastric bypass. And even in the gastric bypass patients, dumping syndrome only happens a percentage of the time. A third of the people will get it all the time, anytime they eat carbohydrates, anytime they eat sweets, they may feel miserable. They may feel like they get the flu out of the blue. They get nausea, vomiting, sweating, um, diarrhea, abdominal pains. Um, and that usually lasts for about a half an hour, about uh, a half an hour after you've eaten those things. Now, the way we treat that is we try not to eat those carbohydrates. We try not to, to trigger the dumping syndrome in the first place. Um, a third of the people, it'll happen some of the time. And a third of the people, it'll never happen. And I can't choose which third of the people will get dumping syndrome, or I can't choose who doesn't get it. Uh, but the operation that most commonly is associated with dumping syndrome is the gastric bypass. Uh, and again, that's not all the time. Uh, will, I, will I have scars on my stomach? So during the course of any of the operations we choose, we typically make uh, approximately uh, five small incisions in the belly. Uh, each of those incisions, one is about an inch long, and then the other four are about a half an inch long or a quarter of an inch long, somewhere between a quarter of an inch and a half an inch long. So five millimeters versus a 10 or a 15 millimeter incision. Um, so the scars are very small. Um, they are um, scattered around the abdomen at different points. Um, they usually heal very nicely uh, as far as minimal scarring. Um, depends on a patient whether or not they're a keloid former or not, how significant that scar may be. Uh, there are options to revise those scars if, if the patient feels that they're a bit unsightly and they don't like the way they look. But in general, uh, the scarring is very minimal and it doesn't leave a, uh, a big footprint behind that you've had a surgery. Will I have flabby skin, excessive skin after surgery? And if I do, would the removal of that skin be covered by insurance? So uh, the, whether or not a person gets hanging skin after surgery is um, it's kind of dumb luck one way or the other. Uh, it, it has to do with how elastic your skin is, so good genetics. 
It has to do with how much weight you lost. So the more weight you the more weight you lose, the more likely you are to have hanging skin. It has nothing to do with how quickly you lose it, or if you lose it during exercise versus surgery. Um, so typically, the more weight you lose, the more likely you are to have hanging skin. So in, in other words, the more successful you are with the surgery, the more likely you are to have hanging skin. Now, young people bounce back better. Um, people with good elastic skin bounce back better. Uh, and there are surgical options, plastic surgical options for managing hanging skin. Uh, however, they're not always covered by insurance. But we do uh, partner with some plastic surgeons in the area that are pretty good about trying to get it covered by insurance when it can be. And typically it can be covered by insurance when a person has an associated hernia, abdominal wall hernia, if they have uh, uh, skin changes or rashes or skin breakdown or repeated infections from the hanging skin itself, um, or if it causes problems with ambulation or ability to walk properly because the, you know, the, the amount of hanging skin is hanging like an apron. Um, the common patient doesn't have that much hanging skin to uh, cause those problems. So it can vary from person to person based on the insurance plan that the person has as well as um, the um, as well as uh, uh, the, the the side effects that are being caused by the hanging skin for that person. Um, will I lose my hair? This is another very common question. So it's not uncommon to lose hair or to have your hair thin after surgery, especially around the six month mark after surgery and lasting until approximately the 10 to 11 month mark. So for that five to six month window right after surgery, um, typically uh, things we can do to try to prevent uh, hair loss are taking biotin, uh, eating a very protein rich diet. Um, and then as, we, as our body gets healthier and as we lose weight, we do uh, very well to, um, as, as, as we lose weight and our bodies get healthier, our hair has a tendency to come back healthier in the long run. It uh, looks like, so um, another question that was just uh, brought to me <laughs> in the room, uh, and this was uh, generated by, by, our, um, by our nutritionist, Carla, here up in uh, Milburn, New Jersey, is uh, one of the questions is, is will I still feel hungry after surgery? Um, so a lot of the surgeries, um, we kind of target the way that you have hunger drive and the way you think about food. Uh, specifically by trying to reduce uh, a hormone called ghrelin. Ghrelin is the big Mac attack hormone. It's the hunger drive hormone. So after the sleeve, after the duodenal switch, typically our ghrelin levels go down significantly. And we aren't hungry as often, but that doesn't mean that we're never hungry, and it doesn't mean we never feel hunger. Uh, it just means we may feel satiated longer, it, and it may be um, uh, easier to curb that hunger uh, should it happen. So yes, you will feel hungry after surgery, but hopefully and likely not as often and not as voraciously. Um, let's see, the next question. How will I know I'm full after surgery? So one way you'll know you'll, you're full is because in all of the operations, we do something to reduce the size of your stomach. So you will be full because you, you will feel full because you are full. You physically can't put anything else in the stomach. Now, as you've had surgery and we move through time, you may, as a patient, become more adjusted to the food you eat. So sometimes you may not feel all the way full and you may find that you can eat a little bit more, you can eat a little bit more after surgery. So it's very important that during the, the, the preoperative time when you're discussing with the nutritionist and you're going over how your diet looks after surgery and how it should be constructed, is that you learn to measure your food and you learn to uh, understand what a serving size is so that you don't eat and eat and eat till you feel full and then eat and eat and eat till you feel full. And that practice of grazing or uh, kind of systematically stretching your stomach may accomplish that goal of stretching your stomach. Um, it's more important to say, okay, I know I should have this much food. And every time I eat, I'm going to have this much food. So I've measured my food or I've predetermined the amount that I'm going to eat. So, so the answer to that question is, is kind of complex, but typically you'll know you're full because you'll feel full. Um, and typically you'll feel full and you'll feel satiated for longer. But if that starts to go away, 
then we have to rely upon measuring the amount of food that we eat and being very careful uh, to not uh, practice a, a habit that would help us increase the amount of food that we can take in over time. Um, will I ever be able to eat pizza and or steak after surgery? So this goes to the idea that bread, rice, pasta, red meat or chunks of meat like a pork chop or a steak may be difficult after surgery. Um, now that's different from person to person and from surgery to surgery. Um, sleeves and duodenal switches have a tendency to get a resistance to those types of foods longer term or more significantly. Um, but everybody's different on whether or not they'll be able to eat those things again or not. Now, typically we don't like patients to be able to eat those things all the time because um, those are some of the very things that have gotten us to where we are in the first place, where we've gained weight. Uh, pizza, bread, rice, pasta, things like that. Um, we would prefer if uh, those aren't things that we gravitate towards as a patient uh, after surgery. That being said, that doesn't mean you can't eat those things or that you can't have them every once in a while, but they shouldn't be staples of your diet after surgery. And um, it's, it's kind of possible that it could be difficult to eat those things long term, or it may be possible that you'll be able to eat those things just depending on how your sleeve or your bypass or your duodenal switch uh, kind of worked out for you. Um, the next question, can I have alcohol after surgery? Um, yes, uh, alcohol is something that we can have in moderation. Uh, we have to be very careful with alcohol. Um, sometimes uh, a patient may become a cheaper date. They may get drunk easier after certain uh, operations, especially the malabsorption, malabsorptive operations like the gastric bypass and the duodenal switch. And we also have to be careful of introducing a new bad habit into our lives. Uh, alcohol can replace other bad habits we may have had before having surgery. So um, it should be uh, met with very specific uh, uh, rules. Um, doesn't mean you can never have a, a cocktail again or a glass of wine again. Uh, typically, um, carb carbonated beverages are more difficult after weight loss surgery. So beer, may be more difficult after weight loss surgery, may make a person feel uncomfortable. Um, also, alcohol is a way of delivering sugar uh, and carbohydrates to the body. Uh, so that is uh, counterproductive to the process of losing weight. Um, so again, you can have alcohol after surgery, but the, but the rules need to be very strict and need to be different and need to be adhered to after surgery so that um, certain pitfalls don't happen. Um, the next question. How long do I have to wait to have sex? So one thing we would ask is that you wait until you're at least out of the hospital. Um, we don't want patients uh, engaging in that activity in the hospital. Um, but typically, there aren't any limitations to uh, sexual activity after these operations. Um, you'll be sore after uh, the operation. And a lot of people uh, may not feel like having sex right after the operation. Their libido might not be there. Um, but uh, the ability to have sex is is you're there and there's no reason why you can't have sex. So typically uh, patients will wait a day or two uh, at least. Uh, but please wait till you're out of the hospital before you do it. Um, <laughs> uh, the next question. Um, how long before I can swim or go on vacation? So um, swimming or submerging yourself in water, we typically like to have people wait till their wounds are pretty much healed. Um, and that would be at least a week after week to 10 days after surgery. Um, you're allowed to take a shower 24 to 48 hours after surgery. Um, we don't uh, want to, I don't typically want my patients to go into the ocean or swim in salt water or other like non clean water uh, for about a month after surgery. Um, as far as traveling or going on vacation, um, it's not a good idea to go on prolonged trips uh, within the first month after surgery. Um, there is a slightly higher risk of developing blood clots uh, right after surgery for the first 30 days. Um, however, short trips, short vacations, taking some time off of work, there's nothing wrong with uh, those items right after surgery. Uh, the following, the, the, the final question that I have on my list is how long after surgery should I wait to get pregnant? Um, Typically, we ask people to, to avoid getting pregnant for the first 18 months to two years after surgery, not because uh, that there would be a problem for the baby per se, um, but 
because it may derail your weight loss efforts. You may have gone through all this work to have surgery and then have a baby within a, the, a year after surgery, and it may derail the amount of weight you could lose, and it derails some of the benefits that you can get from the weight loss surgery. So being a more normal body weight prior to getting pregnant actually reduces the maternal risk and the fetal risk after surgery. Uh, so in other words, if you wait till you've lost the weight 18 months to two years after surgery, you're more likely to have um, a healthier pregnancy. You're more likely to have a normal body weight or a normal birth weight baby, or one that's not you know uh, heavier than typical. Uh, you're more likely not to get gestational diabetes. You're more likely not to get preeclampsia. So you can have a happier, healthier um, pregnancy uh, if you allow the surgery to do its work ahead of time. Those are all the questions I had. I have another. Oh, here we go. So. She's one last. So I have a patient by the name of Tracy. Uh, that she looks like she's on the uh, the the comment list right now. She had a bypass ten years ago here, uh, two hundred and sixty seven pounds down to one hundred and fifty pounds, and she is currently gaining weight uh, back up to two hundred pounds. She says she's always hungry. She says, "How can I shrink my stomach? Is there other surgical options for that patient?" So. Um, Shrinking your stomach, your stomach's the size your stomach is. Uh, the pouch is the size the pouch is. You can do things to help kind of reset your stomach or reset your gastric pouch. Uh, a lot of patients uh, advocate and we advocate trying to do a reset diet, which is going back to the diet that you were on right after surgery, uh, starting with the, the clear liquids and for a week and then the protein shakes for a week and then maybe soft foods for a week and then small small uh, small portions of regular food. But this goes back to the question I, asked, I answered earlier about when can I feel full or how will I feel full after surgery? And it really comes down to measuring the amount of food that you eat and planning your daily diet. I can't stress that enough. So a patient who is having a, a problem with weight regain after surgery, one of the first things that we do is we try to get you back in with the nutritionist. We try to look at what you're eating, how you're eating, how much you're eating, and how you're snacking, and um, and try to make sure that we're not breaking any rules there. Followed by um, the discussion surrounding revision. Now there are revisional options for somebody who's had a gastric bypass. Sometimes we can make the pouch smaller. Sometimes we can make the connection between the pouch and the intestine tighter. Sometimes we can bypass more of the intestine so that uh, the patient's more malabsorptive. And sometimes we can convert a gastric bypass to another operation like the sleeve or the duodenal switch. Everybody's different. Everybody's situation uh, depends on them. Um, and uh, we really kind of work through all those things before we say, hey, this is the one thing you can do for weight regain after surgery. I have another question that's, again, I'm coming in hot off the presses. Um, this is a question from B. Um, advice for people who've hit a plateau. This is very similar to the very last question that we just talked about. And one of the pieces of advice is um, reinstituting your exercise and diet regimen. So uh, going through and making sure you're planning your diet, you're weighing the foods that you have. Come in and talk to the nutritionist so that you are making sure you're doing it right. You're not you know, inadvertently doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, make sure you're exercising. Trying to do 30 minutes of exercise five days a week doesn't have to be training for a triathlon exercise. Going for a nice walk for a half an hour, going uh, on a treadmill or taking your dog around the block, things like that. The weather is getting nicer. We are in the spring now. So it's a really good time to kind of re-energize some of those exercise programs. Um, and then also we can try that, uh, that pouch reset diet where we go back to clear liquids and then... Um, you know, this, the, 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 the yogurt consistency foods and then to the soft foods and then to the, to the regular food, small portions. Um, those are some of the ideas that we have for people who are plateauing or regaining. Um, so this is from Glenn. Uh, shout out to Glenn. He's a, he's a big, uh, he's a big proponent for us. Uh, we, we love Glenn, one of our patients. Uh, he offered to support another person watching you talk about importance of a support system. So, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, Glenn, that's a very good point. So the um, having somebody around you that knows you've had surgery, you don't keep it a secret to everyone. You don't have to tell everyone, but you do have a, a certain core group of people. Maybe the people that you're 
quarantined with right now that you can uh, that you can trust and you can and look to as a support system. Um, we also have support groups uh, through Garden State Bariatrics and and typically through the local hospital that's near you that has bariatric surgery, they'll have support groups. And that will allow you to be able to bounce uh, your thoughts, your feelings, your frustrations, your, your successes with other people uh, who've gone through the very same things that you've gone through. Uh, and that can be incredibly helpful uh, towards uh, maintaining the lifestyle changes that we've asked you to make. Because remember, I said, the hardest thing to change is bad habits and bad habits can creep back. So if we can change our, our bad habits to good habits, and we can have other people around us that are keeping us accountable to the good habits um, and that are supporting us uh, and loving us and making sure that that uh, we don't get down on ourselves if we break a rule here and there. Uh, that can be extraordinarily helpful to have a very good support system around you. Uh, another question. They're coming in. They're coming in hot. Uh, Raymond, how do you calm your nerves about the surgery? So... Uh, that's a difficult question because everybody gets nervous about surgery for different reasons. So some people are nervous about surgery because the idea of anesthesia scares them. Some people are nervous about surgery because um, they've never had surgery before and there's a significant unknown situation. I don't, I don't know what to expect. So I think one of the things that you can do to calm your nerves is to ask every question that comes in your mind. Uh, reach out to us. Um, come talk to us and make sure that we answer everything for you. Hold us accountable to answer your questions and to make sure that you aren't going into any of this with a level of unknown or a level of discomfort because of a big question mark that may be in your brain. Um, talk to people who've been through it. Uh, we have, that's what one of the reasons for the support groups. We have patients that uh, we have like Glenn and some of our other patients that we've had over the years that are that are willing to uh, communicate with our new patients and say, you know, this is what I went through and this is the things that I did in order to feel more comfortable. Uh, I'd like to believe that our, our staff is um, tries to create a nice warm hug for everybody to make sure that everybody feels um, comfortable with what they're about to undergo. And uh, the, and that's I think that's really the best thing you can do to prepare yourself to try to calm the nerves is to prepare yourself to ask the questions and have them answered and 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 maybe watch a video of what we what we do on YouTube or um, come to our website and look at the outcomes of the patients. Sometimes uh, you're not going to be completely not scared. Sometimes you're going to be a little bit scared, but maybe a little bit of scared is worth the the payoff in the long run. Um, so that's some of our before and after pictures that you can look at of our patients on our website are very good examples. Is it worth being scared in order to get these goals uh, met? Um, also, is it worth being scared in order to get rid of medical problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea? Is it worth being scared to be able to uh, bend over and tie your shoes or uh, sit in an airplane seat and not have to get the extra belt buckle or buy the extra airplane seat? Um, that it, There are some trade-offs there. Um, but I think the biggest thing is to educate yourself, and that, that helps go a long way to reducing the level of anxiety around surgery. I, I, think, I think that's all the questions I have for today. Uh, hopefully, I didn't speak too fast. Uh, I, am a, I have a tendency to ramble. Um, but uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again very soon. In the meantime, stay safe. Stay at home. Give us a call. We're here on telemedicine, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, and we can do everything with uh, very minimal uh, physical contact uh, to get you on the, on the path. Again, thanks, everybody. Take care. Be safe.